welcome everybody. It is the top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and just dive right in. I'm sure we'll have other people joining us. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for ADHD KC's monthly meeting for parents and teenagers with ADHD. Um, tonight, we've got a, such an exciting topic. I got to hear um, Peter and Shannon present back in September, was it August now? August at yeah. the Tourette Teen Summit, which was phenomenal. Um, and the information that they shared about driving with ADHD and tics was so important and just so really moving. I mean, as a parent of a child with ADHD and Tourette and having ADHD myself um, and being pulled over often as a driver with ADHD because I'm going fast, um, it was incredibly helpful to know what resources are out there and things that um, my daughter who's presenting tonight can can do um, and can share with law enforcement if that does happen to help keep her safe and things that she can do when she's driving. So I was so thrilled when um, our scheduled October presenter canceled and we were able to reach out to Shannon and Peter and ask if they would present and Sophie as well. So the recording is on. Um, I'd ask that you leave your... Um, your microphone on on mute if you're not one of the presenters. Um, I know we're going to take questions and there's going to be some interactive stuff throughout, um, but I'll let the presenters tell you when that happens. Um, and then let's see. So Chad, you know, I have to read the disclaimer. Basically, Chad does not endorse, uh, support or promote um, any one specific provider, treatment, um, medication, or protocol for the treatment of ADHD, always check with your mental health or healthcare provider for information that works best for you. And so I'm going to turn it over. I think I'll start with you, Shannon, if you want to take us away. Sure. Hi, everybody. Share her screen. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. And then I'm actually going to let Sophie kind of lead us in a little questionnaire we're going to do to kind of start the conversation. But me one second just to share what we're going to present about tonight. Um, so my name is Shannon Floyd. I am a an occupational therapist who specializes in CBIT, uh, Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Tics. Um, and then I'll let Peter introduce himself. My name is Peter Wegman, and have been a driver ed teacher now for roughly sixteen years. A history teacher for twenty three, and I'll be talking about driving. And Sophie? Uh, my name is Sophie Didier. I am 22 years old. I'm a graduate student at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts, um, and I have Tourette and ADHD. So you'll get to hear awesome perspective from Sophie, too. Um, okay, real quick before we start the presentation, we wanted to kind of pose a question um, about your feelings. So I'll let Sophie kind of take over. So yeah, if you just want to go um, to the menti.com website, and then you just put that code in. Um, and I think you can put in three different words. Um, and if you just want to share your biggest concerns or worries about driving with ticks, um, they'll pop up in a word cloud so we can see what everyone's saying. So give up on a second to do that. Yep, I'm going to give everybody a couple minutes and I'll actually share that word cloud so we can see what some worries are. Oh, so you're asking everybody to go there right now to go to menti.com. Yes, go to, go to yes. menti. You just go to menti.com. It's super easy. And then that code right there, the 37090429, you just put that in and you can submit your answers and then we can see them as you're doing it. Oh, awesome. Cool. I'm going to do that. Perfect. Your responses. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and then I'm going to reshare the mentee screen so y'all can see. Um, we've just had a couple responses. Can y'all see that okay? I think so. Good. Okay. Safety of others, getting pulled over. That's a big one. Something that comes uh, that people put in a couple times will keep getting bigger. The word will get bigger. So getting pulled over is a big one crashing, awareness, safety for yourself, um, all great topics and all things that we'll, we'll hopefully touch on kind of as we go through this presentation. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing this. We'll go back to the presentation. Okay, okay here we are. All right, so thank you all for inputting those responses. Um, something that we often talk to people about, you know, uh, somebody who has tics, usually it's 
the concern is how is my child or how am I going to drive with ticks? And the facts are actually ticks are the, the least concern, I guess, sometimes when they're driving. Um, it's usually these coexisting conditions, all these things. If you've ever seen this visual before, this is from the Tret Association of America. This is their tick iceberg. And what it what it symbolizes is that, is that ticks are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's all of those coexisting conditions that kind of lie underneath those ticks that usually cause more trouble than the actual ticks themselves. Um, so just some little bullet points here, severe motor ticks like arm and leg or jerking ticks um, or things that impact vision can definitely make it difficult to maintain when, can, uh, when you're trying to drive. Sometimes the coexisting conditions can be more impactful. Um, and it's common for people with Tourette syndrome to also have uh, the ADHD, OCD, executive functioning issues, uh, sensory processing, anxiety or sleep disorders that go along with it. Um, these conditions can impact awareness, impulse control, alertness, sustained attention, mood and reaction time. And so a lot of times if people are having trouble, we try to take a look at, you know, are you sleeping well? Where's your anxiety? Or how are you managing that? Even sensory processing. You know, if you're in a car and the music's blaring and the traffic's really crazy, that might overstimulate you. So just learning some of those triggers as well and kind of how to adapt that. Uh, most drivers will suppress their tics when they're driving and will understand what makes them worse. And so it was fun chatting with Sophie earlier. Um, she, we, her and I were just talking about her experience with driving and you guys will find that very enlightening. But, but we kind of both agreed that, yeah, most people can suppress um, those tics and just kind of know, you know, some of those other coexisting conditions that we might need to be worried about. Sometimes OCD is the bigger one, um, you know, and so we kind of take a look at that to see what we need to address first. Um, this is attached to the end of this presentation, the link to this research article. I will send it to Jeremy so she can send out to everybody for you to read further. But just a little sy synopsis. Um, they had 228 adult individuals that self-reported a confirmed diagnosis of Tourette syndrome or tick disorder. Of these, 183 had a driver's license. Uh, about 9% reported they had found it hard to pass a driving test. Uh, ticks interfered with driving just a bit, like about 58.5% or not at all, which 33% reported. A majority of participants reported being able to suppress their ticks. That was about 39.5% or that their ticks were unchanged while driving. Nearly half of the participants had been involved in accidents, but only about 3.2% considered that those accidents were actually linked to their ticks. Uh, participants without a driver's license reported significantly more severe ticks. So uh, compared to those with a driver's license that passed the test, the majority of these identified their ticks as the main reason for not having a license. And 64% said that they would like to receive support or to obtain one. So they still had a goal of, of trying to get a license. Um, and so being a CBIT provider, if, if you know anything about that, it's Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks. I'm an occupational therapist who provides that service. Um, these are just some tips that we often talk about when people are approaching, um, either it's parents, you know, who are helping their kids through this, or it's, you know, it's people trying to drive themselves and worried about that. And so we teach them, you know, what are, what are the antecedents? What are the things that are causing you to be stressed or make you feel stressed about driving with ticks or ADHD or uh, OCD or any of those other things? If overwhelmed in busy situations, try to avoid driving during times of rush hour, maybe take the back roads. I know uh, to my daughter's high school, there's two routes you can take. You can take the expressway or there is a back road you can take. So if your ticks are acting up or you're feeling overly anxious, maybe not taking the, the busier, more, more congested way. Eliminate those distractions or triggers when appropriate to do so. So if you're distracted by multitasking, minimize it. Uh, maybe don't listen to music or just have background music on, not super stimulating stuff. Uh, podcast, you know, or talking on the phone, all of that auditory input can kind of be distracting. It's funny as parents, you know, when you're in the car, <laughs> I'll tell my girls, you know, I got to turn down the music so I can concentrate or whatever. Um, and they always laugh at me, but I really do I have to turn it down and then I can kind of get focused. So eliminating those distractions, um, focusing on the strategies that help keep you calm. So if you know, deep breathing, grounding or heavy work, um, like chewing gum, 
uh, is helpful, then then use those strategies, have them accessible to you. And then if you've done CBIT and you have competing responses, we often say use those before you even get in the car. Um, maybe use them at each stop site, uh, stop sign or stop light that you come to. Um, a lot of times we'll get asked about eye ticks because people are worried about being focused on the road while they're, they're ticking. So we say use a visual focal point. Um, focusing on a specific point keeps your eyes on the road. It gives you control over those muscles and what they're focusing on and allows for brief periods of focus. So then again, when you're at a stop light or stop sign, let your tick go like crazy and then kind of get your visual focus point back. And so we often say um, focus on the end of your hood of your vehicle. Um, kind of like, you know, those old hood ornaments they used to have on most vehicles. They don't really have those anymore. But kind of you're looking past that. Um, it keeps your eyes on the road, but gives you something to focus on or the dividing line on the road several feet in front of the car. So you're kind of looking off into the distance so you can still be safe, but give your eyes somewhere to focus. Um, shoulder and arm ticks. We often say push your scapulas into the back of the seat or squeeze the steering wheel. Um, or just pushing one of your hands down into the console or armrest of the vehicle while you're driving with the other one, just to give your control over the arm tick that might be happening. Um, being proactive, mapping out your routine prior to driving to decrease your anxiety. Um, if you have any competing responses, use them before you get in the car. Um, use the coping skills. Once if we just talked about that at a stoplight or stop sign, we often say use that as your break time to kind of reconvene. And then um, sometimes adaptive equipment can be necessary. Um, so like a center knob on a steering wheel or something, if we do have arm ticks to still give us a little bit of control over that. And then the last thing, um, just wanted to mention, let everybody know that there are these medical ID cards. Um, they are free and available on the Tourette.org website. But if you were to ever get pulled over, um, you know, and they're asking you to, to don't move or whatever it is, and you really can't because you have ticks, it's just really nice to have this on your side to say, you know, I have this condition that makes it really hard to do that. All right, I'm going to pass it over to Peter. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> So, you know, just a, a few things that Shannon mentioned um, in terms of, you know, sometimes the concerns people have about driving, maybe a little bit of anxiety. Um, everything she described is really what many of the, the drivers that I've taught in the past who are neurotypical, if you will, um, had as well. There's just a couple of extra steps there for someone with Tourette. And I'm living that right now as I'm going to be teaching my son to drive in December. I'm already taking him out into the parking lot to get used to the car. Um, some of the statistics that were mentioned that were granted self-reported in terms of people with driver's license, one needs support. Um, those are within the margin of error, the 5% margin of error, um, statistically for what, again, neurotypical people experience as well. Um, so there's not a, a huge difference there is my point. And then the safety, being pulled over, crashing, the concerns that were mentioned on the, the board there in the beginning, again, standard concerns. Um, and they're all good ones, but it's nothing extra, if you will. Um, driving in general for a teen is, is a rite of passage. In other words, it's an opportunity to, to get out of the house, do things without mom and dad. And that's important because you have that sense of freedom. However, as you do get that new sense of freedom, as I tell many of my students, um, you also have some responsibilities to go along with it. Um, it's just the basic reality of driving. Um, you know, the, the first one is keeping yourself safe on the road, keeping your passengers safe, following the rules of the road so that you're keeping the vehicle safe around you. Predictability on the road is actually what keeps everybody safe. The idea that somebody will use their blinker to change lanes so that you can see that ahead of time to know what's going on, that they're following the speed limit roughly, things of that nature. And then, of course, there's an economic piece as well, um, bringing home the car in one piece. And all of those can be summed up when I think back to... One of my brothers who called my parents to say I had a fender bender and the, the phone call went as, are you okay? Are your passengers okay? And how was the car? So again, these are all things to, uh, to consider. Um, as far as your first steps, um, get yourself comfortable. So you want to sit in the driver's seat um, and with the help of your parent, your guardian, your instructor, um, you want to find each control on the vehicle. Where are the wipers? Where are the lights? How do you adjust the mirrors? Every manufacturer does something a little different. Their models many times have are the same, roughly. 
Um, but the manufacturers do things differently. So anytime you're in an unfamiliar car, you want to find these things before you get on the road. Um, and that makes your life so much easier. Um, first thing you really want to do is set the car seat first, because from there you'll be able to reach all the controls, see, the, see out of the mirrors and things of that nature. Because if you do anything else before setting up that car seat, then you'll have made all those adjustments, then you'll have set the car seat, and by setting the car seat, you now move yourself out of position for the previous adjustments that you made. Um, so having a pattern that you follow, if you will, is usually good. I get in, I do the car seat, I adjust my mirrors, uh, maybe buckle in at that point. In other words, having your routine each time you get in. As far as distance from the steering wheel, um, usually you hold your hands straight out like that, and if the steering wheel is underneath your wrists, uh, that's roughly a good distance. And then if your shoulders are pulling back from the seat, bring the seat back up a little bit. Um, again, comfort is the most important thing, but that's roughly where you want to be as far as driving. And then start in an empty parking lot. Um, empty parking lots are great. Get comfortable with the car, drive around. I think I may be on the next slide now. Yeah, I am. Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> so um, you start that parking lot. And once you're comfortable, get out onto the road. But the parking lot is a great place to come back to. In other words, to practice skills, isolate skills, um, you know, things that you might see athletes do from time to time. Um, you know, a batter just batting the ball again and again and again. Um, similar concept here where if you want to practice stopping. You go back to the parking lot. You look at the empty spaces. The end of the spaces is your stop sign. That's where you want to stop each and every time. And it takes time to get that, probably about 15, maybe 20 minutes. And then after that, go into a neighborhood and practice it on a regular street, because many times that makes it a little easier, too. And it gets hard to imagine a stop sign after a while. Um, you can do the same thing. I, I see my pets have enjoyed this. My apologies. Um, so where was I? So back to the, the parking lot. Again, for stop signs, staying in the lane. Again, you imagine the lane that you're in. Um, things of that nature. And then get back out into the streets, move from a neighborhood street to a slightly busier street, and eventually move yourself to a highway. Um, as far as extra help to drive, there's a lot of options out there. Typically, although it does depend on where you are a little bit, um, many schools still offer driver education. So go that route if you can. Um, if you need to work with a driving instructor, certainly do that. Um, I have had students that have, have come to me and said, you know, Mr. Wegman, I've been driving with my mom or my dad, but they're, they're holding this bar up there the entire time. It's not going well. Um, at that point, I suggest to them, narrate what you're doing on the road. Narrate as you're approaching the stop sign, narrate what you're seeing with the cars, uh, things of that nature. Many times that helps the adults in the car kind of, I'll use the phrase, calm down. In other words, they've been driving for a long time. They've internalized a lot of things. In other words, there's things they know to do without even thinking about it. Um, so they may be seeing things that they don't think you are. So by narrating it, um, now that opens up the conversation. They know that you're seeing it. They can start talking about what to do next, things of that nature. Um, and you only have to do that a few times before you begin to develop a report. Um, after that, as far as safety, um, know where your jumper cables are in the car. Know where the tire changing kit is. Know where the manual is because that will explain things. Also be aware that manuals can be downloaded onto phones. So if it's not in the glove box, you can typically have it on your phone. Um, have a plan if you're stuck on the side of the road. Who are you going to call first? Um, and then as part of that plan, too, does the family have roadside assistance? Do they have AAA? Do they have something to their insurance company? Um, is there nothing? Um, but then you know. And sometimes that conversation does, as my students have come back to me and said, well, we, we discovered we don't have a spare tire in the car. Uh, the jumper cables are broken. And uh, they, they did find the AAA cars. You know, things like that sometimes come back. Um, after that, if the car's got to be towed, know where to have it towed to. Um, who's the family mechanic? Uh, many times the tow truck wants to tow you to their garage, which makes sense. This is how they do make some business. But um, once it's towed there, the second tow costs you money typically. Um, so the first time knowing where to take it is usually the best. And if you're stuck on the side of the road, if you think you need the police, call them. That's what they're there for. They will come out. They will assist, um, provide advice if that's what you need. Uh, but don't hesitate to do that. 
Um, oh, and I will hand off to Sophie. Yeah, so these are just some uh, tips I've compiled um, from my own driving experience. Um, I'm all too familiar with getting pulled over by law enforcement, unfortunately. Um, as Shannon was saying earlier, this is mostly um, due to my ADHD, I think, as opposed to my tics. Um, so taking my meds is definitely very important. Um, every speeding ticket that I've gotten has been I was off my meds, which is shocking. Um, another thing to be conscious of is your limitations, um, the severity of your tics. Um, I have a eye tic, so if I'm having a bad tic day, um, it's okay to step away from the wheel. Um, there's no shame in Ubering or getting off the highway, pulling over, asking a friend to drive. Um, if you don't feel like you're going to be safe to drive, there's, there's no shame in not driving. Um, so yeah, oftentimes ticks are suppressed while driving, I find. Um, like other activities when I'm playing lacrosse um, or doing other things when I'm focused, um, I find that my ticks tend to minimize or suppress. Um, and then just some tips for when you do get, if, if you do get pulled over by law enforcement, um, just staying calm um, and communicating with officers, your tics. Um, we talked about earlier the medical ID cards, carrying those with you. I think that's very important just so they know um, what's going on and they don't think that, you know, you're on something or they, they know how to um, properly um, help you. I was going to add to um, back to what Sophie was saying real quick about the law enforcement on the right hand side. There's just a little visual and it's it's more for it comes from a toolkit from the Tret Association of America's website made for police officers or law enforcement. Um, and if you are a new driver or soon to be driver, um, it's not a bad idea to stop into your local police department. Just introduce yourself, you know, hey, I have ticks. You can um, print or ask for a hard copy, it's free, um, of that toolkit to provide to them because sometimes they don't know and don't have the tools, but um, you kind of make yourself known if you feel comfortable doing that. And then they just understand a little bit more if that were to happen too. So just a little um, being proactive kind of thing. That's all we have for you. Um, thanks, thanks for listening. I'll kind of kick it back to Jeremy and stop mm. sharing. Short but sweet, guys. That was awesome. Actually, can you go back to that toolkit and make it a little bit bigger so we can see it or um, yep. share the link? Yeah. Sorry. Let me, go share, Let me share the, I'll share the link in the chat. Oh, that'd be great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know here um, in Kansas City, we have um, several like special needs education fairs where um, a lot of times law enforcement will come and have a table and you can, you know, either go introduce yourself or bring your kid and introduce them if they're a new driver. Um, or like we have two sons with autism and um, they're kind of like registered. So if there ever were to be, you know, a situation where law enforcement had to come to our house, they would know that we have two sons that have autism here. Um, and, and I just think that you, know, you can't go wrong with making that connection early. Um, I'm excited to see the toolkit. I think that's amazing. Putting it in there now. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? If there's questions, let's post them in the chat. And there's no dumb questions, so feel That's free. <laughs> yeah. This was great, you guys. Thank you so much. I mean, I think just knowing that there's, you know, all these resources available that you may not have been aware of, I mean, such a great idea, particularly as a parent, like I said, but also I think for our young drivers out there too, you know, because that's just a whole nother, you're already nervous when you're learning how to drive. And so it's more likely that you're going to be ticking. And then to have a over or have that, you know, added pressure of potentially needing to navigate that situation. I think it's, it's great to know that this is out there. Um, let's I see. Too, I think, Peter, I think one question we got last time, maybe we could touch on it because it was helpful. Um, I know people were asking Eric just his experience with the process of getting his driver's license. Like if oh, that yeah. was any different than somebody who would just normally go in and, and you were kind of speaking on that last time. Do you mind sharing that? No, not at all. Well, First of all, I'm in New York, so the process of getting a license in Missouri um, or 
I think Kansas. Nebraska is right over the border. <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> did not make that mistake, I understand. So, um, but it's going to be different. So, for example, in New York, um, a new driver has to get their permit, which they can get when they're 16. They then have to take what's called a five-hour course, which, no pun intended, is a crash course in New York State driving law or driver's education. Um, then they have to drive 50 hours, um, 15 at night, and then they have to um, have that permit for six months before New York will let them um, take the road test, um, which makes sense because back in my day, you get the permit, take the road test the next day, and it usually had a poor outcome by Saturday. <laughs> so my point of telling you all that is each state has different rules, so look into those first. And then if you have any considerations in that process that they have, and that's a conversation to have with your doctor, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, whoever's, um, you know, following your care to see if you need to do anything extra, if you will. Um, and ideally they know because they've had to go through it before with patients. And so for your experience in getting your license was a little bit different since, um, well, I mean, you learned to drive in Kansas, but now, you know, you live in Massachusetts. And so have you noticed any differences between there and here? Or do you want to share a little bit about your experience getting licensed? Oh, uh, yeah. So on Kansas, we get our permit at 14, um, which is really scary, actually, to think about now. That's quite young. Um, <laughs> and then when you're 15, you get your restricted so you can drive to um, work, school and home um, by yourself. And then when you're 16, you are fully licensed. Um, and it's similar with the 50 hours and then 15 at night. Um, you have to do that. And I took a driving course, so I don't know what the other alternative is off the top of my head. Um, passing a driving test, I guess, I think. Um, but yeah, in Massachusetts, I will say, I feel like because I have a Kansas license plate, I feel like I get pulled over so much more often. Um, and yeah, I've been racking up the tickets out here. So being, being, well, no, par well, pa parking tickets mostly, mom. Again, um, but I feel like, yeah, so just being aware of um, the driving laws in different states, you know, if it's a hands free state, even if you're looking at directions on your phone, um, just being aware of things like that, I think is important. Yeah, I think it's changed a little bit. Like when you're 16 now, you you're not quite fully licensed. Like you have to be you can't be driving after a certain time at night and you can only have one other person in uh, the car with you. Um, and I think it's not now till you're either 17 or maybe it's 16 and a half. I can't remember, but um, where you're fully licensed to have more than one person in the car with you and you can, you know, not that we want you to be out driving till two o'clock in the morning, but, you know, I guess legally you potentially could be. Yeah. Because this has been great. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, 30 minutes is perfect <laughs> for me and for most of our, uh, our audience. And um, I know that we're recording this. And so the recording will be available. It usually takes us about a week to get it edited and get it up on the website. Um, any last thoughts or parting words that you, our fabulous presenters would like to share this evening before we sign off? Nope. All right, cool. Well, thank you again for doing this. I really appreciate it on such short notice and you've been really amazing. Thank you for sharing your time and your energy and information and wealth of experience with us. Thanks for having us. We appreciate it. All right. Have a great yep. night, everybody. Thanks for being here. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.